it all to peace the storm surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Oh 
If you like to stand as we sing, please do so. I'm so glad you went with me. I'm so glad Jesus went with me.
may be seated. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone this morning, everyone that's here and everyone by live stream. And uh, just a reminder, if you'd turn off your cell phones or put them on silent so that we can keep our focus on worship this morning. And uh, we're just going to bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the wonderful things you do for us. Every day we are thankful for being free to come to this building and worship and praise your holy name. As we worship you, may we also show our love to our sisters and brothers in Christ. Lord, you are our only hope. We thank you for the work done at Calvary. May we always worship and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we had Friday a very special day in our country. What is it? Birthday. Well, what is Canada Day? It's our birthday. And does anyone know how old we were on Friday? 155 years old. I'm hoping I'm never going to be 155 <laughs> years old. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just, I know that in this day and age, and against Canadians, we have a lot of worries about our country, don't we? Yeah. We have concerns. Um, we have fears, and we're not all in agreement. We're not all happy with the way things are going. But you know what? We are so blessed to be in this country because we can say we're not happy with the way things are going. <laughs> At least for now we can say it. We are blessed. This is our nation. And we are asked to pray for our nation, for our government, for all those who are in authority over us. And so I just want to take a quick prayer for Canada. And then we're going to stand and we're going to sing two verses. Because you know there are more than one verse of O Canada. Two verses of O Canada. And there's the flag. You know where to where to aim your head. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you so much for enabling us and for some of us bringing us to a nation that is still free. And we pray that it will continue to be so for many, many years more until the Lord returns. And of course, we pray that he returns very soon. Lord, we pray that uh, your word would go forth in our nation, and we pray that you would use your church mightily to proclaim that word. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our prime minister and for our MPs, for our senators. We pray your blessings of wisdom and good discernment, godly discernment, Lord, in the way uh, they are governing and in their care for this nation, may they be servants. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> yeah, I think standing's a good idea. Take it back, we'll just sing it a cappella. Okay, here we go. Here we go.
strong and free. Lord, keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from Numbers 31, 1 to 11. It's from the New King James Version, and it says here, Vengeance on the Midianites. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel, and afterward you shall be gathered to your people. That means Moses was about to die. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves for war and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for the Lord on Midian. A thousand from each tribe of all the tribes of Israel you shall send to war. So there were recruited from the divisions of Israel, 1,000 from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. Then Moses sent them to the war, 1,000 from each tribe. He sent them to the war with Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, with the holy articles and the, and the trumpets, signal trumpets in his hand. They warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. Evi, or Evi, Rechem, Tzur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian, Balaam, son of Bur, they also killed with the sword. And the children of Israel took the women of Midian captive and their little ones and took a spoil all their cattle, all their flocks, and all their goods. They also burned with fire all the cities where they dwelt and all their forts. And they took all the spoil and all the booty of man and beast. Well, may God guide our pastor to make sense of what we just heard. Okay, if you'd like to stand as we continue worshiping the Lord in song. <clears throat> Okay. 
you have called us out of darkness into your glorious light, that we may sing the wonders of the living May our every breath we tell the truth that broke into our strife with Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I'm just up here to do the announcements very quickly. And then I've also ran it by Pastor Dan. Um, this morning I was reading through my devotionals. And this one really struck me and it really spoke to my heart. So I'd like to share it with you after the announcements. It's only about a minute long. But the announcements, first of all, are the... Uh, Again, just a reminder for a prayer meeting on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Um, it's here every, every Wednesday night. Um, if you can't come in person, you can still join via on One Accord on Discord. Contact Mike Fair. Um, that's something that we, we're, we're mentioning every week. I just want to encourage everybody to come out if, if you can make it. Um, because when you come out in the body of Christ, it's such an encouragement for each and every one of us that, that do come out. And sometimes when we can't come out, it's still an encouragement if you can do it online. So if you can, if you can, please, please uh, make that part of your week. 
Um, also, Let's Connect happens this Friday, July 8th at 1 p.m., and everyone is welcome. Um, and large print um, copies of our daily bread from July to September are now available across from the Fellowship Hall. We also have a recent update from Zach and Minnie Nandy, and that can also be picked up across from the Fellowship Hall. Um, the devotional I was reading this morning is actually from on Father's Day when Rhonda and the children gave out these books, and this one's called Men of Valor. And this one is about William Booth. I'm sure many of you know who William Booth is. If you don't, he was the gentleman that the Lord used to start at the Salvation Army. The scripture starts off in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's from the King James Version. And it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Isn't that amazing that we have... When we give our lives to Christ, that he creates, he, he makes us a new creature, and that's something that really hits home with me. So a little story about him. Born in 1829 to a working class English family, William Booth had a humble entrance into the world. 83 years later, his funeral was attended by 150,000 people. Even the Queen of England paid her respects. A long road of faith led William Booth from, from obscurity to founding the Salvation Army to his ultimate prom promotion to glory. Too poor to attend school, working as a pawnbroker's assistant to support his family, William knew destitution. At age 15, though, the, the trajectory of his life shifted when he put his faith in Jesus Christ. In his diary, he wrote, and this is what really struck me, he said, God shall have all there is of William Booth. Almost immediately, he began to evangelize to the poor and the needy. Salvation remade William Booth. His actions, motivations, and plans changed because of his commitment to Christ. Today, does God have all there is of you? And that's what struck me. As soon as I read that, I stopped in my tracks and had to ask myself, does he? When you commit fully to him, you may not expect large crowds to attend your funeral, but you'll have crowns of your own to offer to God in glory. Praise the Lord. Um, I would also like to ask Sharon Ellis to come on up. She has something she'd like to say. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So next Sunday after church, we're going to be having a lunch downstairs, uh, and I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about my next plans and what's going to be happening uh, with where I'm going to be moving to and what I will be doing, and a little bit about what I've done in the past. So if you want to come and watch a film that I've worked on and hear some of my story and why I do what I do uh, and eat delicious Middle Eastern food, uh, you should come downstairs uh, after church next week. And if you think you're going to make it, um, we've got a little sign-up sheet back by the uh, sound desk where you can just put your name down and how many people you're going to be just so we can have a rough idea of numbers. And so if you're online and you can't sign up, that's okay. You can still come. It's just for kind of getting a guesstimate for how many people we're going to be feeding. All right. Hope I see all you guys there. We have been supporting Sharon, as you well know. So if you want to know how your money is being spent, come and join us after church on Sunday. And you get fed as well. I mean, you can't go wrong. Um, we have a wonderful blessing of having Rosie Cochran here with us. And I thought uh, we'd call her up uh, just to uh, get a t couple of minutes on uh, what she's doing. And I, I told her a couple of minutes because we want to make the service somewhat, uh, we want to get out sometime at a reasonable time. So, but you know what, if you need to take three or four or 10, you know, you do what you have to do. Well, we are, I already said to him, if I take too much time, then when he goes over, he can blame it on me. So, you know, this is a win-win for him. <laughs> um, it's good to be here. I know we've all had a lot of changes in the past few years. COVID turned our world upside down on our personal lives in um, many ways. Um, actually, in ministry, you know, that created many challenges for missionaries going overseas. It's really good to see that at this point, so many are actually back, you know, teaching, you know, into the villages. Churches are still being planted. Bibles are still being translated. The many challenges that missionaries have faced going overseas you know, I, I hand it to them, the ones that are doing it this time. You know, you get a family of five, one person gets 
a negative, a positive test, and suddenly the whole family has to rearrange all their flight pan, you know, plans and everything. There's been a lot. Um, at the home office, we have short-term trips, and those have been a challenge and to be able to do in these past few years. They're a great recruiting tool. They're, we have mobilized so many people to come into missions through those, and you know, not being able to do them has been a challenge. So this year, one of the trips to called Encounter that we were able to take to Mexico, our team took down there. It, not Mexico, sorry, um, Brazil. You know, we were all so excited they got to go there. They get there, and they actually ended up in quarantine a good bit of the time. You know, it's like, oh. But then as they're coming back, and my coworker came back, and um, just, she came back the day I left, so I didn't actually get to talk to her in person. I was down in Florida for a few weeks here. Um, she gets back, and she says, 10 of the 15 people on that team want to go into missions. You know, it's how God works, even in circumstances that we think don't seem ideal and aren't, aren't really happening the way we think they're supposed to. And yet, you know, 10 young adults challenged to go into missions through that trip when they were even in quarantine. You know, it's just so cool. Amen. So thank you. I'm not going to take a whole lot more time. Thank you for, you know, for praying for us, for praying for my mom. Maybe one of the other things that was helpful in COVID in my position at the home office, I'm the director of communications. It's not really ideal if you want to say that you're not there. And yet, when COVID came in, we were forced to work remotely for quite a while. Um, so when it came to the point wanting to come up here to be with mom, it's like, no, we can actually do this. You know, it just kind of opened the door that that was a more doable thing. So it is neat how God, not that he brought, we're not really that thrilled on COVID, but just how he works out all the details in our lives. And, you know, we serve a great God. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. God is good, isn't he? Hallelujah. And God is in control. And prayer changes things. And we keep in prayer. And there's one more announcement that I would like to make. And that is that I've had a request uh, for, uh, from someone uh, who wants to follow the Lord in, uh, in the waters of baptism. And so I just want to announce that uh, I will be starting a baptism class. If there's anyone here who has not been baptized um, as, or, or, or has not been baptized as a believer and would like to be baptized, come see me. Uh, over the course of today or, or the next uh, week, you can call me and, uh, and uh, we will set up a class once I have an idea of who's, who's involved. And uh, those are all the announcements. Let us uh, bow our heads and, and pray to the Lord. Almighty Father, we sit here and stand here, some of us, before you, because we recognize that you are the God that deserves all our worship, all our praise, all our thanksgiving. You have given us salvation while we were still enemies of you. You brought us to faith. Lord, we thank you so much for that. We thank you for the love we receive day by day, the mercies you make new every morning. We are blessed. And we want to lift up to you this congregation. We want to lift it up to you because we want you to make us a lighthouse in our community. We want you to move in our hearts through the power of your spirit that he might force us to get out there and to seek and to save the lost. For that is what Christ came to do when he came on the earth was to seek and save the lost and he's called us to do the same. And we pray for those who are in our community that they might know and come to know the Lord, that your Holy Spirit would go before us and 
touch lives and touch hearts and touch minds and prepare them and then give us opportunity to speak the truth into those hearts, into those minds, into those lives, that fruit may be born for your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that we have the blessing of those who have been sent and those who go forth that we've been able to support and all the others who are missionaries in the field, whether they are here domestically, whether they are across the world, we praise you for them. We thank you for the opportunity of being a blessing to those in ministry who are taking the word out to others. We pray, Lord, your watch care over them. We pray, Lord, your blessings over them. You, we pray, Lord, that you would bless the, the fruit of the wor work of their hands as they seek to serve you. We especially want to, to lift up to you, Timothy and Emma Condi. We know that they've had a quietude because of COVID, but now they're ramping up and we pray that all that they're doing, as Tim directs the ministry, with the help of Emma, would powerfully bring things forth, powerfully. We thank you that they were able to have their family winter event. We're, we're so grateful, Lord, for the uh, retreats that they have been able to have during the spring. We play, pray that many hearts were changed and that many came to faith in you and that those who were in faith, their hearts were strengthened and their faith was strengthened. We thank you that they can use the facility again at Campbellville. We uh, pray that they will have uh, the opportunities to bless many people over the course of this summer. And we especially want to pray uh, in the midst of their ministry about the ministry of David and Noah, who are helping out in the mission. They come from Liebenzell Mission, and we know, Lord, that you are doing some amazing things through Liebenzell in Germany. And, uh, and we pray that uh, those young men here in Canada, from whatever country they come from uh, in Europe, will be uh, a blessing. And we pray that they will be blessed. Lord, we thank you, too, for those missionaries who are in our midst. We thank you for Rosie and all that she's doing. We thank you, Lord, for Sharon and all that she's doing. And we pray that you would bless their ministries as well. Lord, we also want to pray for those in our midst who are dealing with loss I want to lift up to you, Veronica, as she has lost uh, and found out just this morning that she's lost a dear, dear friend whose mother has, has had many losses over the course of this last year and who leaves a son, 20 years old. And we pray for that family. Her name, too, is Veronica. We pray for her. We pray that you would uh, bless the mother and give her strength in this very difficult time. Help her to lean on you. And may she feel your comfort and also for the son, Lord. We pray the same. We pray for those in our midst who are ailing. We thank you for the healing we've seen in many and, and the continued healing. We think of Dan Page and the healing in his hand and Mike as his foot is healing and, and coming to uh, a closure in that healing, God, you're, you know, if you are willing. But we pray for those who are undergoing sickness now. We pray that you would bring healing to them. We pray that they would 
know that you are the healing one. And may it bring glory to you. And we pray all these things because we know you hear our prayers. We know that you hear even the the prayers that we can't even imagine in our heads, but the Holy Spirit we know groans on our behalf and takes those prayers up to you. And so we give you thanks and praise for all of the answers to your prayers. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm up. I might as well stay up, huh? We are continuing in our series called In the Footsteps of Faith as we go through 1 Timothy. And today I'm going to be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading from verses 1 to 15. 1 Timothy, uh, sorry, 1 to 13. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. Let us uh, bow our heads and pray as we bring our worship to the Lord before him as we worship him in his word. Almighty Father, we give you thanks for your word. We pray, Lord, that as we delve into your word this morning, that it would not just be uh, something we do, but something we cherish. Give us the longing to know your word, not just to hear it, but to know it and to use it to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word. And we all say together in his name, amen. Amen. How many people have been in a doctor's office? Raise your hands. I'd be amazed if you hadn't ever been in a doctor's office. Now, when you go to a doctor's office for the first time, what do you do? Any? You look around, right? And you know what? You're going to look and you're going to see framed diplomas. And you'll see that they graduated from the University of Toronto and they got their MD there or they got their MD at McMaster. And you can see that they have their credentials from the CMA, the Canadian Medical Association. And that feels good. Why? Because you know that the doctor you're going to see 
is qualified to be a doctor. You'll see that with lawyers. I don't want a lawyer representing me or someone representing me who hasn't passed the bar. That wouldn't be a good idea. You want a CPA who is qualified. Well, God here in these, this passage that I just read, through the Apostle Paul, has given us qualifi qualifications for the leadership of the church. We sit here as a body together. But you know, this church works together because we have people who are taking roles in the church, yeah. leaders. People who are watching over the church, helping the church to do what it does. And one of the leaders that Paul first deals with is what he calls bishops, or what he calls overseers. The word he's using is episkopos, which means overseer. It's sometimes translated bishop. And that's why you have the Episcopal Church. They have bishops. When the Anglican Church became Americanized, it became the Episcopal Church. But it's also considered elders. And we can see in Timothy that there are elders, that these bishops, these overseers, are elders of the church. And Paul starts off by saying that it's really a good thing to aspire to the office of overseer that people who wish to get to the role of overseer, that's not a bad thing. Now, of course, elsewhere in scripture, we know that it's the purpose of the heart that makes it bad. If it's for my own well-being, then it's not a good reason. But he's saying that those under God, under the, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, if they desire to be elders, they, that's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. But then he, he brings these, uh, these um, uh, uh, qualifications to bear. It's a good thing if you have these qualifications. It's not the position so much as be the qualification that we are seeking. We're aspiring to be such that we could be seen as elders. And there's quite a bit here. Did you notice? Because there's not only these needs for, for personal qualifications, there's spiritual qualifications as well. And this is the kind of qualifications that as we fill them, we can find fruit in the work that we do for the kingdom. So what are these qualifications? Well, first of all, the first thing that uh, Paul says is that the, the overseer, the, the elder, I'm going to use elder from now on, needs to be above reproach. Now, what does it mean to be above reproach? How, how, does, how, how are you above reproach? Well, I would just suggest simply that being above reproach means that you're not culpable of anything. No one can say, put a charge against you and say, oh, he does that, he's disqualified. We need to be above reproach. And I just want to warn us as we say we above reproach, let's face it, we all have history. Some of us were not believers at one time. And I don't want any of that to be brought to the future. Actually, I'm very open about it, but you know, that's not me. I'm a new person under Christ. 
And the issue is to be above reproach as you live your life now and in the future. We're supposed to be, as elders, and maybe I should talk about your elders. Your elders include uh, Wayne and Gibson and myself. As a pastor, I'm an elder. That's another term for episcopos, is pastor. He's also called a shepherd. An under-shepherd. But he's to be a husband of one wife. And what he means by that is you're supposed to be monogamous. And true to God's institution of marriage. Marriage is an institution that was set by God for his purposes. And it was to reflect his glory. And so those who aspire to be elders need to understand that in marriage and to to live accordingly with their spouse in that way. They're supposed to be sober-minded. Now later he talks about drunkenness, but sober-minded here I suggest means that you're simply thinking straight. You're, you're, You're thinking reasonably. We might use the phrase, he's got a good head on his shoulder. An elder must be self-controlled. He's got to be in control of himself. When temptation comes his way, he flees. He's not easily given in to temptation. He's respectable. Which means that when people see him, he is deserving of their regard, of their respect. That they see someone and they say, wow, Boy, wouldn't it be nice to be like him. An elder is supposed to be hospitable. The the Greek word here is philoxenos. Philo is, is the word, is a word for love. Greek word. And xenos is where we get the word xenophobia from. Anyone know, get a guess? It's a stranger. Love and stranger. And here we get that translated as hospitable. That's what it means. It's giving themselves to the care of others. Not necessarily just the care of people we know, but people we don't know. We just let people into our hearts and into our lives. Uh, Also, an elder is supposed to be able to teach. But is that all he says? No. Because he says that he is supposed to be able to teach well. To teach well. So first of all, to teach, you need to have knowledge, right? I can't pass on things that I don't know. And that knowledge we're talking about is the knowledge of the word. He has to be spiritually knowledgeable but he also has to be able to pass that knowledge on and to do it well so that people can receive it and understand it. And now we know that they're not supposed to be a drunkard as well. They're supposed to be sober. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we're told that if we're going to be high, we're going to be high in the spirit. And that doesn't just include alcohol, that includes any mind-altering drug. Because we are supposed to be sober and sober-minded. We're also supposed to be, as elders, gentle as opposed to violent. We're not seeking peace, or we're not seeking war, we're seeking peace. And we're not trying to extend violence, we want to curb violence. That's why he talks about them being not quarrelsome. We're supposed to respond with kindness, not belligerence. And then we have not a lover of money, 
not trying to do everything for your own gains. When we're caring for people, we care for people, not for ourselves. There's a tendency to want to look good by giving, but then expect something back. But true giving is giving without expecting anything back. Now that's just two verses. And there's more. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? In other words, the, the elder has to be a good family man. He needs to know how to look after his household, both physically, well, both, but all, all of it, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Now, here's my question. Does that mean that an elder's household has to be perfect? Because then nobody's qualified to be an elder. But when, if there's a problem in the family, you know what you're going to find? That when you look at the way the, the mother and the father raise their children, They've done their best. Nothing can be, they're not culpable. And he must not be a recent convert, we are told in verse 6, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, there are young believers who may be very knowledgeable, and very equipped in all these qualifications. And I think sometimes you may be able to find an elder who is young and who can be an elder and not become puffed up. And if that's the case, that's fine, but it's always a danger. You always have to be careful about that. Because it is so easy to fall into the sense that I am really special before the Lord when we're young in our faith. And that's not good, not only for the church, it's not good for that individual as well. And that is Paul's point here. And finally, it says, moreover, an elder ought to be, uh, sorry, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. See, an elder is also, among other things, one who stands between the church and the world at large. Not that we aren't all involved in the church. But, you know, when uh, something's happening and, and the news uh, the local news wants to contact the church to see, they're going to contact the pastor. That's who they want to talk to. It's just the way it is. And the, the, the point that Paul is trying to make is that an elder has to be someone who the, the world can respect. Right and there are pastors who when you look at the way they, they behave with the world and even within their congregation, they do not inspire respect. That's a problem because they are not qualified according to the word of God. That's a lot, isn't it? And you have three elders. And they perfectly fit that, do you think? No. No, we don't. We're not perfect. We aspire to be perfect. And we seek to know God better, and we seek to be more and more like this. Paul is giving us what a good elder should be. And we seek to be good elders. 
Now he's going to deacons, and I'm not going to take as long on the deacons as I did with the elders, mostly because much of what Paul says about the elders, he says about the deacons as well. Now, deacon means servant, or slave, actually. It's actually a bond servant, someone who is a willing servant to a master. And of course, who is the deacon's master? Well, it's Jesus Christ. And they are to look after the practical needs of the church. How do we know that? Well, we go back to Acts chapter 5. And in Acts chapter 5, we see the Jerusalem church going because there was some issue in the church about uh, handing out food and, and, and other things to the widows. There were widows that, that come, came from Judea, and then there were the widows that came from outside of Judea, and they weren't getting their fair share, the, the women outside of Judea. So they go to, the, to the, the apostles, and the apostles basically say, look, we're, we're here to, to pray about you and to lead you spiritually. Why don't you choose a bunch of guys, seven men, that they might be able to serve in that practical way. And that's what they did. And they took them to the apostles, and the apostles approved of them, and they went out and did their, their roles. They were the first deacons of the church, the servants of the church, the slaves who work in the church to help the church do all that it needs to do. That's what a deacon is. And yes, there is a sense, and we had that wonderful message last week that everybody, I'm sure, was very excited about as we talked about men and women in ministry. But um, there is a sense in this passage that Paul it's talking about men, but we know that there were deaconesses as well. We know that there were deaconesses of note, like Phoebe and Lydia and so on, who Paul knew and was very familiar with, were friends with. And I think if we looked at the context of the first century church, most of those women who were deacons were the wives of deacons. They were, in, in the Jewish context, and certainly the first century church was very Jewish in its context, in that context, women, men did not minister to women. Women ministered to women. It was not appropriate for a man to minister to a woman. In the, in the special ways that Women need ministry. So the, the wives took place. And that's why uh, we see that there are qualifications for the wives. That they should be dignified and not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. They're supposed to be much the same. And I'm sure that the elders and their wives were also there, but because the wives for, of deacons were heavily involved in, in, in ministry, Paul mentions it them here. And also, just a few points, that they like their wives, must be faithful born-again believers. That they understand the mysteries of the faith, is what Paul says. They need to understand it. And not only that, they need to do it with a clear conscience. They need to know that what they're saying and what they're doing is of God, is according to the word. They need to know the word. And then Paul finishes here. It's interesting. He starts with 
the, the fact that an aspiration to be an elder is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But then he finishes with this, for those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Good leadership brings about a good reputation. And that being a good leader with a good reputation reflects on the glory and the love of God. Because good leadership is about loving God and loving the people and letting God's glory shine. But it also creates confidence. The church wants to follow godly leaders. Good leaders. Leaders they can trust in. So very quickly, because I know time's running away on us a bit, but what can we take away from that? Well, first of all, we do see a definite dichotomy of leadership between elders and deacons, between overseers and the servants in the church. And that, first of all, is that the elders are responsible for teaching the word, interpreting the word correctly, being truthful to the word, and being capable of expressing that word and passing it on to the congregation so that the congregation understands those words. And they also, as we see when we talked about uh, Acts chapter 6, where uh, the, the apostles were saying, go appoint deacons, is that, we, that elders have the spiritual concerns of the church. They are the ones who pray fervently for the church. They are the ones who seek to know the Lord's will spiritually to help guide the church. Not on their own, but, but together with the whole church, but they have that, spiritual, that, that role of spiritual care. But deacons and others, leaders, And they are the leaders in the practical issues of this church. That's what the board of directors does. Taking care of the practical aspects, the budget and the finances and, and how, you know, the facilities and the ministry needs and so on. And our missions. But all, whether elder or whether deacon, we're very clear here that they all have to be spiritually qualified. Spiritually qualified. They need to be able to do the things that will take their ministry further, the practical things, but they also have to know the Lord. They have to be able to know the gospel, and they have to be able to follow the gospel. But here's the thing. Go back to the beginning. This saying is trustworthy. Paul says that a lot with Timothy and with Titus. <coughs> Excuse me. This saying is trustworthy. So this is the saying we should all listen to. Here's a noble task. 
Let's silently pray issues to the Lord that we might be cleansed by the blood.
you open up, there's two slabs. Uh, one is a clear one and one is not. You want to do the clear um, tab before the bread. And then after the bread, uh, we'll, you take the other tab off for the, for the cup. I would ask our brother Gibson if he would pray for the bread. Loving dear Father, we thank you for giving us Jesus. And we thank you for the, his torn body that was destroyed for our own sake. Even as we take this piece of bread, remembering that his body was broken, let there be healing in our bodies, O oh God. Let there be joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat all. I would ask my brother Wayne if he would do the prayer for the cup. Father in heaven, we are reminded in your word that before the foundation of the earth, you had this plan. And throughout your dealing with men, with your children, you prescribed the way for them to have forgiveness of sin. And you demonstrated that the only way for forgiveness of sin is through the shedding of blood, innocent blood. And in your plan, Father, you sent your son to be the supreme sacrifice, that sacrifice, the blood of the Lamb of God, your son, would cleanse us from all unrighteousness and iniquity. And Father, today we remember that. And as Jesus spoke to his disciples, he said that this blood has a very special place in their lives, this wine that they were taking to remind them. And we're reminded today that this is a reminder of what the blood of Jesus has done for us. We thank you for this. We celebrate this today, realizing that our salvation today is due to the, the death and the burial, the shedding of the blood, and then indeed our hope is in the resurrection as Jesus is alive and well, and he's coming again. Father, that's great reason to celebrate, and we do thank you. But remind us each day of our thanks that is due to our Savior Jesus and his blood that we shed for us. In his name we pray, amen. In like manner, Jesus took the cup after dinner and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me, drink all. For as often as you Eat this bread and drink this cup. You manifest the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Please stand as we do this last song in closing.
the Lord. us go out and serve you. Bless us, Lord. Bless our comings and goings. Bless the words of our mouth to speak of you and speak of your glory. And make us blessings, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
is cold.